This episode is supported by Squarespace. How can we use the geometry of complex functions to mathematically modify an old drawing tool? This is a 400-year-old drawing tool called a pantograph. It's a mechanical device used to scale things, like drawings or maps. You hold it fixed at this end and then expand or contract and rotate it around a point. If you put a pencil on this point, the output, and move the middle point, the input, so that it follows along the outline of a shape, then the pencil point will trace out an exact double of the shape, like this. When we mathematically abstract pantographs, we find that they have an incredible relationship with complex functions, which are basically like little machines that take in a complex number and give back another complex number. Let's start with a quick primer on complex numbers. They're basically just real numbers with a special element added in, which we usually call i. The element i is defined as i equals the square root of negative one. So i squared equals negative one. Complex numbers are sometimes called imaginary numbers, but I think that's kind of funny. They don't seem any more imaginary than the rest of the numbers. In any case, the element i is often called the imaginary unit. When we write complex numbers, we separate out the parts that contain the imaginary unit from the parts that don't. If we call a complex variable z, we can write it in two parts, z equals a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. Even though both a and b are real numbers, we call a the real part of z and b the imaginary part of z, since it's multiplied by i, the imaginary unit. Because complex numbers have two parts, it's very natural to represent them in two dimensions. The distance along the horizontal axis, also called the real axis, denotes the real part of a complex number. And the distance along the vertical axis, also called the imaginary axis, denotes the imaginary part. The complex number a plus bi can be thought of geometrically as the point a comma b on the two-dimensional real plane. Okay, going back. I said that we can imagine the pantograph as a complex function. Let's lay the pantograph flat on the plane with the end of the left arm fixed at the origin. Now, we can rotate it and we can expand and contract it. Regardless of how we orient the pantograph, the number pointed to by the right arm, the output, will always be two times the number pointed to by the center arm, the input. That is, it corresponds to the complex function 2z. If z equals a plus bi, then 2z equals 2a plus 2bi. For example, 2 times 1 minus 3i is 2 minus 6i. Multiplying a complex number by 2 just means multiplying both the real part and the complex part by 2. The point moves twice as far away from the origin, and that's exactly what the pantograph is doing. Let's say you slide the middle arm of the pantograph along a shape. Each point on that shape is a complex number. The left arm is drawing a double-sized replica of that shape. It's drawing exactly two times z for every point z in the original shape. We can make a pantograph associated with the function c times z for any real number c. For example, if c equals three, it scales everything by three, making our shapes three times as large. Or, if c equals 1 half, it shrinks them in half, like this. To change the multiple that it scales by, we change the ratio of the side lengths of the pantograph. This is the multiplies by 3 pantograph. You can rotate it around the leftmost vertex and you can slide it in and out like an accordion. But, no matter what you do, there will be a small triangle in the bottom left, which is exactly a third of the size of the big triangle. They're similar triangles, meaning they have the same angles but different side lengths. So, the right corner of the big triangle will be three times the right corner of the small triangle. We can generalize this to make a pantograph that multiplies by any real number r bigger than one. Just make this segment one and this segment r. To multiply by a number smaller than one, like one half, just use the pantograph that multiplies by two, but trace the object using the rightmost point and place the pencil at the center point. Now we're gonna lift the abstraction up one more level. Instead of viewing the pantograph as a free-floating mechanical device, 
we can think of it as flat and embedded into the plane. More specifically, we can think of the pantograph as a graph, which is just a collection of vertices connected by edges. The left vertex of the graph is fixed at the origin, but the other five vertices are free to move. But there's a restriction. The edge lengths between the vertices are fixed. In terms of the real physical pantograph, this corresponds to the fact that its arms are made of a rigid material. It's like the pantograph, but drawn on a piece of paper. The name we give to this abstract object is a linkage. Let's build a different linkage, one that corresponds to a different complex function. This is the translation linkage. It corresponds to the function z plus l, where l is the length of this edge. Remember the general setup of a linkage. This vertex is fixed at the origin and the other vertices are free to move, but their edge lengths are fixed. In this case, if we trace a shape with this vertex and place a pencil at this vertex, it will draw an exact copy of the original shape, but L units to the right. Here's a linkage, which we could call the addition linkage, that adds two complex numbers, Z and W, together. Let's be precise about what it means to add two complex numbers, z equals a plus bi and w equals c plus di, together. How do we write z plus w? Easy. We just add their real parts together and add their imaginary parts together. So, z plus w equals a plus bi plus c plus di, which is a plus c plus b plus di. For example, 1 plus 3i plus 2 minus i is 3 plus 2i. But that's adding with algebra. How do you add with linkages? The addition linkage is made by combining two of the multiply by two pantographs. Here's the first. This vertex is at z, and this vertex is at w. Since the left vertex is not at the origin, it's not actually multiplying by two. Instead, it's averaging the two. That means the middle vertex is z plus w divided by two. It's halfway between them. Now, layer the second pantograph on top of the first. Its left vertex is fixed at the origin and its middle vertex is on z plus w divided by two, the middle vertex of our other pantograph. Then the right vertex will correspond to z plus w. So you can expand and contract and rotate this addition linkage, which you can envision as a real mechanical device so that these two vertices line up with any two points you want to add together, like one plus three i and two minus i. The location of those two points determines the location of the middle point, which in turn determines the location of the outside point, which will be their sum, three plus two i. Notice how the addition linkage was made by combining two linkages? Well, we can combine the linkages we've already made and a few others to make some wild new ones. There's a linkage which takes any point z and multiplies it by the imaginary unit i. What's so cool about that? Well, multiplication by i rotates a point 90 degrees counterclockwise. Here's an example. i times 3 plus 2i is 3i plus 2 times i times i since we just distribute the i like normal multiplication. And that's 3i minus 2, since i times i is negative 1. So, if you use the linkage associated with the function i times z and trace the input vertex along a shape, it'll output the point in the shape multiplied by i, which is exactly the shape rotated 90 degrees. Here's the kind of bummer part. The linkage that rotates your drawing by 90 degrees is really complicated. It involves combining dozens of other linkages. There's also a linkage corresponding to the square function. If the input is on a point z, then the output will correspond to z squared. Let's review how that works. If z equals a plus bi, then z squared equals a plus bi times a plus bi, which is a squared minus b squared plus 2abi. So the real part is a squared minus b squared, and the imaginary part is 2ab. But here's what's geometrically interesting about it. When you square a complex point, the radius, so the distance from zero, squares, and the angle measured off the positive real axis doubles. Let's see that in action. 
Here's some complex points, and this is what happens when you square them. Using the linkage associated with the polynomial z squared, if we traced these two shapes, we'd get these two wild-looking shapes back. Again, the squaring linkage is really complicated. It's made up from many, many other linkages, which is unfortunate because it would make very interesting copies of your shape. These are not the only linkages we can make. In fact, by combining linkages in the right way, we can make a linkage associated to any complex polynomial. There's one for this polynomial, or this, or this. And each complex polynomial distorts shapes in its own wild and wonderful way. See you next time on Infinite Series. Thanks to Squarespace for supporting this episode. Whether you need a domain, a website, or online store, Squarespace can help you make your next move. Squarespace provides an all-in-one platform with templates that allow you to easily set up a website. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. If you want to make a website devoted to pantographs, Squarespace is there for you. Start your free trial with Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter offer code INFINITE SERIES to get 10% off your first purchase. In last week's episode on hypercube slices, a commentator who is not a walrus gave a great explanation for why n choose k appears. The plane we sweep is built in such a way that its equation is x1 plus x2 plus x3 and so on up to xn equals k, where we vary k from 0 to n as we sweep. Because all the vertices have either 1 or 0 as coordinates, this equation only has solutions for integers k, and each solution corresponds to choosing k coordinates to be 1 from the n available. We can't include every detail of these big complex problems, and I love reading the way you all use the comments to fill them in. Joel Nordstrom expressed his disappointment that we didn't show an animation of a three-dimensional hyperplane sweeping through a four-dimensional cube. Luckily, many of you obliged his request with links to videos and GIFs. Here's a great one from Rob Nicolades. I want to add that part of what I really like about the article that originally described the method of obtaining hypercube slices from Pascal's triangle is that it was written in 1991, when computers were a lot less helpful in visualizing higher dimensions. Speaking of the original paper, I would highly recommend it to anyone interested. In this episode, we were only able to dive into a tiny fraction of what they prove. They have results about the volumes of these slices, probability, and connections to other math problems.